Welcome again to our series on apologetics. I'm glad you're here. In this video, we're going to introduce and explore the topic of the existence of God. This is the best of all the metaphysical questions that has been debated by philosophers, scientists, and theologians for centuries. It's fun. We're going to look at the most consequential question of the human existence. Does God exist? And if so, what does that mean for me in the long run? Like the really, really long run. The purpose of this video series is to give you a rational and reasonable basis to believe in the existence of God. That is where we'll start and that is where we'll end. Rational and reasonable arguments. What you do with all this is between you and God. Does God exist? Is there a rational and non-emotional but reasonable basis for a belief in God? If you open your heart and your mind to objectively study the issue, I think you will be genuinely surprised. If you approach this question with a hardened heart and a closed mind, I can promise you, you're likely to miss it. You're simply not ready. It is good to be skeptical. It's totally normal, if not expected. Certainly, if God gave you your brain, he's not afraid to engage with it. In fact, you were bestowed with enough intellectual horsepower to grapple with the larger metaphysical questions of life and answer them. So be excited. This is a grand adventure. With an open mind and an open heart, it is far easier to digest the truth and come to a logical conclusion. We will use logic, reason, and truth. Look for it and you'll find it. In fact, in the first four videos of this series, unless you skip ahead, we will not even mention the word Bible. God's existence can easily be found in the natural sciences and in human experience. Of course, many fair-minded people don't believe that God exists. Others simply don't know one way or the other. Some have left the church for a variety of personal reasons and are left with a vague and muddled faith. Personally, I was in the last group. I'd grown up in a Christian home, and when I went to college, I couldn't find a good enough reason to believe. In truth, I'd borrowed my parents' beliefs as a result of my upbringing. I didn't harbor any resentments against God or the church, or my parents for that matter. But at the same time, I felt like I had more inherited a tradition as opposed to a faith or a belief system that I could call my own. So I just drifted with no real belief system because I couldn't find a path to establish my faith. I developed an interest in astronomy when I went to college. I later bought several large telescopes and loved looking deep into the universe. I often would wonder about creation. It's hard not to when you see the beauty of the heavens. I realized that I needed to get this issue resolved, so I started to study. This study was for me. It wasn't for my parents or my friends or a pastor or anyone else. This was just for me. If I was going to believe in God or not believe in God, I was going to develop my own belief system based on my own studies and my own discoveries. Like I said a moment ago, if you approach this question with a hardened heart, I can promise you, you're gonna miss it. You need to be open-minded. By that, I mean you need to have at least honest curiosity. You can even be skeptical, that doesn't matter. That simply means you're using your brain. But you need to be intellectually honest with yourself and objective. If you're not ready, that's okay. Perhaps your time is not now. That, my friend, is between you and God. One common reason some people have closed their mind and heart and will not consider a belief in God is because of some past hurt from Christians or negative experiences with organized religion. Now, I don't minimize those encounters for a minute, truly. It is important to acknowledge these valid concerns and address them directly. So let's do that. First, it is important to note that not all Christians or churches are the same, and it's possible to find a supportive and welcoming community within the faith. By way of example, if some idiot driving a Ford truck cut you off on the freeway and made you angry, or caused a collision where you or a loved one were injured, would your issue be with the driver or with Ford Motor Company? Would you make a vow to never own a Ford because some idiot driving a Ford made you angry, hurt your feelings, or caused actual injury? That wouldn't make any sense. That line of reasoning wouldn't survive the light of day. In the same way, there's no logical or rational reason to reject God simply because someone from a church or group said something you didn't like or related to you poorly. These things can happen. They don't happen very often. But the church is filled with people, and over time, people make mistakes. One of the beautiful things about Christianity is that it makes provision for anyone to enter into a relationship with God. 
And the good news is that the vast majority of people you meet are all focused on their own spiritual journey with God and are working hard to improve themselves and their lives. But like I said, occasionally people do make mistakes and offend others. It's unfortunate. And it doesn't happen very often. But if that happened to you, I am truly sorry. However, that should not prevent you from making one of the best and most important decisions of your lifetime. Not at all. That would be no different than allowing that truck driver to keep you from discovering God's love for you. Why on earth would you allow that? It makes zero sense. Again, that kind of logic doesn't survive the light of day. That is an example of what I mean when I, I mention an open heart and an open mind. Don't close yourself to such a grand adventure because of the actions of someone else. And one more thing before we get started. My personal favorite response to the question of God is from the I believe in science crowd. Truly, it is my favorite because it's just so intellectually lazy. Simply stated, science is not now, nor has it ever been about belief. Nobody that understands anything related to actual science would ever make such a statement. It's one of the great oxymorons of our lifetime, certainly of the last several years. I believe in science. If you truly think science is awesome like I do, then you know it isn't a belief system. It's quite the opposite, or at least it should be. If you love science, buckle up, because this is going to be fun. Think of it this way. If God created the universe, he also created mathematics and physics, logic and reason. You should fit right in. You don't have to believe in mathematics or physics for them to be true and real, any more than you need to believe in God for him to exist. Get it? So let's talk about science. In fact, let's start off with a quick chat about the scientific method. The scientific method, by definition, is a systemic approach to research that involves making observations, asking questions, forming hypotheses, and conducting experiments to test those hypotheses. I mean, that's it. The goal of the scientific method is to determine the validity of a claim and gain a better understanding of the natural world. So let's do that. Let's rely on logic and reason and see where it leads. The concept of God is different for everyone. But when we talk about the existence of God, we're talking about a being that is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good. This being is the creator of the universe and is responsible for its design and purpose. So let's go straight into it right now. Let's talk about three main arguments for the existence of God. Again, these are logical, rational, and reasonable arguments. No emotions, and we're not even going to talk about the Bible. The first one is called the cosmological argument. Next is the teleological argument, and then there's the moral argument. Big words, but I'll break them down. They're really simple to understand. There are more philosophical arguments for the existence of God, but these are the top three, and that's what we'll focus on in this video. The first one is the cosmological argument, which states that everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. The cause of the universe is what we refer to as God. So what does that mean? Well, the cosmological argument asserts that the existence of the universe and everything within it points to the existence of a greater, eternal being, often referred to as God. This argument is rooted in the idea that everything that exists must have a cause. Therefore, there must be an uncaused first cause that brought the universe into existence. Now, that's a big statement, but all it really means is something can't come from nothing. It needs to be caused, and something needed to cause it. So, something had to exist before space, time, and matter to cause space, time, and matter to exist. And that is what's known as the first uncaused cause. The discovery of the Big Bang, which marked the beginning of the universe, supports this argument as it points to a singular event from which all matter and energy originated. This singular event, or first cause, is understood by scholars as the work of God, bringing the universe into existence ex nihilio, or out of nothing. The cosmological argument is a powerful tool for demonstrating the existence of a higher power and the intrinsic meaning and purpose behind the creation of the universe and all that it contains. So, the big question here really is, what existed five minutes before the Big Bang? Whatever it is lives outside of our space and time. What lit the bomb that blew up? This argument can be further explained by scientists and philosophers, but it has been discovered that the universe began with a singularity, a point in space and time with infinite density and temperature, and that this singularity is the cause of the universe. That is the Big Bang, the nearly universally accepted understanding for the beginning of the universe. 
our next video goes into tremendous detail about this cosmological argument and the details leading up to the acceptance of the Big Bang, but we're not going to spend that much time in this particular video. We're just going to hit the highlights. One of the key principles in science is causality, which states that every effect must have a cause. The principle applies to the universe as well. The universe exists, therefore the universe must have a cause. The cause of the universe must be something that is outside of the universe, something that is not bound by the laws of physics, and something that is eternal and uncaused. This is what we refer to as God. Many people come to a belief in God for this reason alone. It is a powerful argument. The second argument is the teleological argument, which states that the universe exhibits signs of design and purpose. The intricate balance of the universe, the laws of physics, and the beauty of nature all points to a designer. An example of design in the universe is the law of physics. The law of physics are mathematical equations that govern the behavior of the universe. These laws are so precise that even if they were slightly different, life as we know it would not be possible. The laws of physics also exhibit fine tuning, which means that they are precisely balanced to allow life to exist. This fine tuning of the universe cannot be explained by chance alone. It must have been designed by something or someone else outside of the universe. The famous British physicist Sir Fred Hoyle once said that the probability of life existing on Earth is no greater than the chance of a tornado sweeping through a junkyard and assembling a fully functioning Boeing 747. It just can't happen. The odds of life existing on Earth are astronomical and point towards a designer. As early as the 18th century, William Paley, born in 1743, challenged the world with a watchmaker analogy. Simply stated, if you were walking along a forest path and your foot kicked a stone, you would not think much of it. But if you looked down and found that you had kicked a watch, you'd have to wonder how it got there. Nature could not have created such a meticulous, piece of precision by itself. Somewhere there had to be a watchmaker. The complexity and beauty of the universe cannot be explained by chance alone. The universe exhibits signs of designs and purpose. The laws of physics, the fine tuning of the universe, and the complexity of life all point towards a designer. The designer of the universe is what we refer to as God. One of the best examples of design in the universe is the human eye. The human eye is a complex organ that is made up of several parts that work together to allow us to see. The eye has a cornea, pupil, iris, lens, and retina. Each of these parts serves a specific function, and if any one of them is missing or not working properly, the eye will not function. The complexity and design of the human eye cannot be explained by chance alone. It must have been designed by something or someone, which leads us to a recent scientific discussion surrounding something called the irreducible complexity. The irreducible complexity is the fly in the ointment for evolution. In the 1990s, Michael Behe, a biochemistry professor, put forth an argument that some natural systems observed are just too intricate to have resulted from evolution. He stated that some biological systems are so complex that they could not have evolved through gradual step-by-step -step processes such as mutation and natural selection. The argument states that such complex systems must have been created fully formed. That was like setting off a nuke in the science world. Proponents of irreducible complexity argue that some biological systems, such as the bacterial flagellum, are far too complex to have arisen through natural processes and must therefore be attributed to an intelligent designer. By the way, the bacterial flagellum is an honest to goodness motor and a propeller in the back of a single cell organism. It has the same components as an outboard motor on a boat. It is incredibly complex and has so many necessary independent components to it that it completely defies logic that it somehow came about through the evolutionary process. No matter how many billions of years have transpired, it simply defies cognitive logic and rational thought to think that all these separate parts that are absolutely necessary in this intricate system would have separately evolved and somehow clumped together to create such a magnificent engine. Now, furthermore, proponents of irreducible complexity argue that this complexity provides evidence for an intelligent designer, for God. The top five biological systems 
that are often used as examples of irreducible complexity are the bacteria flagellum, a complex molecular machine that allows bacteria to swim and move, the blood clotting cascade, a series of chemical reactions that work together to quickly stop your bleeding, the eyeball, the optical system that captures and processes light to produce visual images, the cilium, a hair-like structure that functions in cell movement and fluid flow, the last one, number five, the vertebrate immune system, a complex network of cells, tissues, and proteins that defend the body against foreign invaders. Now, as you can imagine, the very notion of irreducible complexity set the evolutionist hair on fire. And the reason is simple. If there is even one single organism that can only be reduced down to an irreducible complexity, the theory of evolution is irreparably damaged. Its very foundation crumbles and its house of cards comes crashing down. Now remember, evolution as the origin story for all life is just a theory. This is when science first became a religion. Scientists cannot prove the theory of evolution, but it acts as a large shield and allows them to deny the existence or need for a God to be the originator of the universe, time, the natural laws, and life. If you can deny God, then you're not bound by any of his laws or morality. You can deny the existence of sin and live your life on your terms, which sounds very enticing, unless it's wrong. In the last 70 years, our secular society, with the help of governments and universities around the world, have doubled down on evolution as the only possible explanation for life on Earth. No other cause is allowed to be heard or taught. Any other explanation offered is immediately spurned as heresy and bullied off stage. This is where young Christians like me with borrowed beliefs were easily mocked, ridiculed, and had their fragile beliefs destroyed. The university can be a meat grinder for ill-prepared young Christians with borrowed beliefs. And so there is a war raging around the very notion of irreducible complexity. This is all very unscientific, of course. I mean, objectively speaking, the science community as a whole should be intellectually fascinated by any new discovery. Any scientist or critical thinker who is being intellectually honest can see that this is true. Science is not something to believe in. It is something to establish. If there are irreducible complexities swimming around in our bodies, in plants, in the oceans, then the theory of evolution is unceremoniously flushed down the toilet. And that, my friend, is not something that our secular society can allow, for all the obvious reasons. But you, and I'm talking directly to you, that's who I want to reach. You don't personally owe anything to an unproven scientific theory or a university professor or a system of thought. If you have an open heart and an open mind, you can see that this is objectively true. What do you owe to a theory? Nothing. The teleological argument is a powerful argument. It is rational, it is logical, and it is reasonable. Many people have come to belief in God for this one reason alone. Which leads us to our third argument, the moral argument. The moral argument for the existence of God is a philosophical argument that claims that the existence of objective moral values and duties implies the existence of a moral lawgiver or God. The argument is based on the idea that morality is not simply a human construct or cultural preference, but rather it is a universal absolute and objective standard that exists independent of human opinion, cultural variation, anywhere and everywhere in the world. The moral law we sense is different than other laws, like gravity, for example. Gravity describes what happens, but the moral law tells us what ought to happen or what ought not to happen. No matter where you go in the world, think about this. Cowardice is held in absolute derision as is lying, cheating, stealing, and murder. These are just a few examples. Think about it again. Held in derision across every culture. The moral argument is that God writes these laws in the heart of every man and woman. These are standards of morality that transcend culture or tradition. These are written on the heart of every man and woman on the planet. The desire to help to do no harm. 
This standard of morality requires a source of authority outside of human beings, and the most logical explanation for this source is the existence of a moral lawgiver who transcends human experience and provides the foundation for all moral values and duties. God. The basic logic statement for the moral argument can be stated really easily. If objective moral values exist, then God exists. Objective moral values do exist, therefore God exists. The first premise of the argument is based on the idea that objective moral values cannot be explained by natural processes or human culture. Instead, they must have a supernatural source which is consistent with the existence of God. The second premise is supported by the widespread existence of moral values and duties across different cultures and historical periods, which suggest that they are not simply a product of human preference or social convention, but rather they are grounded in a universal and objective standard. Across time, across oceans, these standards are the same. One of the key philosophical defenses of the moral argument is the idea that moral values and duties are not simply subjective or arbitrary, but rather they are objective and universally binding. This implies that they cannot be reduced to mere culture or personal preferences, and instead they require a transcendent source of authority. Proponents of the moral argument argue that the existence of God provides the most logical and coherent explanation for this source of moral authority, and therefore serves as evidence for the existence of God. The moral argument is a powerful argument. Many people have come to the belief in the existence of God for this reason alone. So where does this leave us? Well, the cosmological argument, where we started, says that 13.8 billion years ago, the universe exploded into being from a dense, hot singularity. Where did that singularity come from? What was there five minutes prior, five seconds prior, five years prior? Were there years before there was the Big Bang? Logically, something can't come from nothing, right? Can something come from nothing? No. Some opponents hope to prove that since you can mathematically calculate an expression to infinity forward and backwards on a piece of paper, that somehow something can come from nothing. But that makes no sense. We live in a natural world, not a theoretical world. You can pick up a rock, uh, a piece of paper, and some scribblings on a piece of paper can't make that rock go away. The question is simple. What caused the Big Bang? Something had to. Philosophers call this the uncaused cause, meaning God. The Big Bang brought forth an entire universe of matter and all of the elements that had to have a cause. All that matter, all those elements, gold, iron, everything, came from something. They did not come from a concept of infinity. They did not come from nothing. They came from something that caused the Big Bang. Logically, rationally, reasonably, that uncaused cause is God. Next, we have the teleological argument. Evidence of design. The watchmaker. The 747 that just simply can't be assembled no matter how many tornadoes rip through a junkyard. The irreducible complexity. The teleological argument is a powerful argument. Many people have come to believe in the existence of God for that reason alone. So, three separate and mutually exclusive arguments that all point to the same thing. For the cosmological argument, it's the uncaused cause. For the teleological argument, it's the designer, the watchmaker. For the moral argument, it's the transcendent source of moral authority. All three are God. These three logical and reasonable arguments provide ample reason for a rational and logical mind to conclude that there's both a reasonable and rational belief for the existence of God. These arguments show that the universe had a beginning and therefore must have a cause and that the universe exhibits signs of design and purpose that point towards a designer, and that objective moral values exist, and therefore God exists. These arguments, either separately or together, provide a rational and logical basis for the belief in the existence of God. It's important to note that these arguments do not prove the existence of God, 
but they do provide strong evidence for it. The evidence of God is ultimately a matter of faith. But as believers, we can have confidence in our faith because of the rational and reasonable evidence that supports it. But you might be pondering the last major objection. If God exists, why is there so much suffering in the world? And that is a legitimate question. And this is an important legitimate question that we'll explore in later videos in this series. But for now, just remember that the existence of God is not based on our ability to see or understand him, but on the rational and reasonable evidence that supports his existence. That's where we are now. The next several videos in this series will delve deeper into these arguments for and related to God in order to give you a more solid understanding for each. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I have several videos beyond this that go into greater detail on the cosmological, teleological, and moral arguments. Be sure to subscribe to our channel and like these videos and share with your friends. Up next, the cosmological argument. Thanks for watching.